Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with an old friend of mine and a uh, longtime uh, uh, advocate of public arts in New Mexico and arts in general, Sherry Brueggemann, who is the manager of the highly successful Albuquerque Public Arts Program and currently a UNM adjunct professor in the College of Fine Arts, uh, teaching a course on public arts management. For years and years and years, I've been I've been writing about public arts in Albuquerque, and I've been always always enthusiastic and sort of uh, amused by uh, the sometimes uh, conflicts involved with it. But I do believe that me and billions of people around the world are concerned with art in their cities, and Sherry has done a magnificent job in our town managing a program that really has national recognition. And now she's involved in something that is, um, how should I say it, highly, highly innovative, ironic, paradoxical, curious, uh, involving public art in a virtual city with no public. Uh, she's going to explain this all to us in great detail. Uh, because it's also about exploring the future of public art in in a wired world. So it's wonderful to have you with us. It's just great. I can't wait to hear what we're going to talk about. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's always a pleasure to come visit with you, and uh, especially on a project like this, which is really all about, you know, kind of crazy thinking and <laughs> art and the role of art in our communities and cities. So this is going to be a fun, fun chat. So let's try and place this in, in time and space. Uh, this whole project is in response to, a, uh, to the appearance of a proposal for a virtual city in New Mexico by Pegasus Global Holding. I'm not going to talk anymore about it. I want to hear what you have to say about it. Could you explain it to all of us? So right now, this uh, idea kind of only exists virtually, but the plan is to actually build a real city in southern New Mexico. It's a city that will be built specifically for testing. So it's called the Center for Innovation, Technology, and Evaluation, Site, C-I-T-E, City. And um, it's about a 15-acre city uh, with, with a proposed population of about uh, 3,500. Uh, I'm sorry, 35,000. Um, that's the size that the city would, would be built at. So it would have a city hall. It will have one exit ramp <laughs> into a city. It'll have a main street. It'll have a library. It'll have a park. It'll kind of have one of everything that a lot of cities have, but it will have legacy infrastructure, which I love that word, which uh -huh. means that they're building, intentionally building infrastructure um, in the way that cities have been built for many, many years. Also, it can be tested with new technology going in and, and um, evaluating how a city works with layering new technology on top of it. But, of course, the rub of it is, is there no people? Right? But there will be, underneath it, I understand, a kind of a, a virtual, virtual city with real people in it, kind of like the undergrounds in the workings of Disneyland. Uh, but so, so I'm... I'm really curious as to what intrigued you about this project. And I also want to ask you, uh, we know that they had originally planned to go into Hobbs, but but there was some infrastructure problems there. And where is the site uh, proposed for now? And, and then I want to ask uh, how you got involved in this and what sparked you. So I stumbled upon this article in the Business Weekly a few months back, actually probably about six months ago, about a fake test city in southern New Mexico that was going to come about. And I read a little bit about it and uh, about what they were going to be testing. And I thought, well, a city, every city should have public art. <laughs> so there should be public art here. And I kind of wanted to launch this idea about what kind of public art would you have in a city with no population, <laughs> where it's basically a population of scientists and researchers um, that are there studying a city with no people. And how could public art be part of that? And I thought about this idea and I thought about just sort of, you know, um, lurking and, and reading up on, on their progress to see what a city with no culture 
would be like and if they would plan culture if they would plan public art on their own if they would plan these kinds of amenities but if there's no people there does that mean there's no culture there so as it turned out with the class that I'm teaching this semester at UNM public art project management uh, we needed a real project to walk the students all the way through the process of developing a call for artists soliciting artist proposals and then evaluating them so I said hey How do you all feel about doing a call for public art in a city where there's no people? And they were enthusiastic, no doubt. Extremely enthusiastic. I mean, they really, it took them a few minutes, you know, 10, 15 minutes of me sort of explaining the site and what it meant for them to get it. But then once the idea sort of caught on about the freedom an artist could have to propose public art in a city with no people or a city that is all about testing. Maybe public art needs to be tested. There was a lot of layers there. We we started unpacking and had a lot of fun with. So as I understand it now, the uh, the site of site is possibly somewhere south of, of Interstate mm-hmm. 10 between Deming and Cruces. Um, I don't, I've been looking around for it and I, I haven't seen anything at all, so I don't think there's any particular timeline involved yet, but, but that doesn't have anything to do with with your class, obviously. The thing that I'm really the most interested in, I think at the moment, is is the notion of a, of a place that's going to test green energy and infrastructure, digital infrastructure, smart, smart transportation, all kinds of things. And basically looking at, at cities in the future, and so, which implies to me that you're looking at public art in the future. And then there must be a tremendous theoretical aspect to that, and I'd love to hear about that. So we've kind of tap dance around the theory of this, of um, the future of public art. And yes, there would certainly, we think for our class project, that there would be an opportunity for artists to have access to big data, research data about this technology that they're going to be testing in the city. And what if that data itself actually informed what the art is? Mm -hmm. Um, Or it could go the total opposite Spect- opposite way on the spectrum and could have sort of the traditional bronze art placed in the middle of a median or something and if they're testing driverless cars that you know drive themselves based off a of GPS will the car know to go around the sculpture or not so it's it's putting public art in the environment to be tested but also using the knowledge that comes from that test environment to inform public art could be really really way out there yeah. if, if the artist has access to that sort of research data and information. But, you know, and everything in between that spectrum about whether the art itself becomes something that um, contributes to the testing environment versus in, is created by the testing environment. It's, there's so oh. many layers and nuances to how art could be integrated into this this space that we really left the call for artist open. So what we did is we developed a real call for artist. We have advertised it in the United States. Um, our partners at the uh, callforentry.org have allowed us to do this call um, on their website for free. The developers and their engineering firm, uh, Perkins and Will, has been extremely supportive in providing us all the types of uh, digital images that they have of the site and the plan and the layout. Oh. They even provided a little video, sort of a flyover of the proposed city at this point and how it works and have really endorsed the student project because I think they themselves are very intrigued with this idea of as much as they need to create a test city and simulate as much of a city as possible, public art should be part of it in some way. But they're also very open to the idea of having artists propose what this art would be for this very, very unique kind of place. So we know that Perkins and Will is also doing uh, the design uh, work for Innovate Albuquerque, which is an interesting, interesting crossover. We also know that... that uh, um, Pegasus is doing a lot of homeland security work in that area, but we won't go into that at the moment. What I'm curious about is is the um, is what the students think of it now that you've talked about it, and now that you've actually gotten I don't know what you say uh, 
seven. half a dozen or so uh, applications from artists. That must right. be a big thing for them because because suddenly an idea that seems kind of way out and you really have to stretch to wrap your head around it, it suddenly becomes very concrete, very real, um, as, as almost all virtual things actually are. <laughs> Right. Well, here it has manifested as a real project, yeah. and we haven't looked at those seven proposals that have come in yet. We still have a couple weeks for the deadline to hit, and we hope that we have a lot more to look at. And Pegasus has not said whether or not they would actually fund a public art project, but they're mm -hmm. very intrigued. Um, we've invited them to be on the committee and look at them, so who knows? They might go forward with, with actually commissioning an artwork if they like one. Um, but at at the real level, what at least we're being able to do is the students are serving as the selection committee, ah. and they're going to select um, a half a dozen finalists, and we will put their uh, proposals in the exhibition that's coming up in 2015 in Albuquerque um, about the history of public art um, and all art and design in Albuquerque ah. in like an the exhibition Museum? in the museum. Yeah. And so that will be a way for those artists to at least have their concepts sort of recognized. And it will give our local public an opportunity to sort of say, wow, is this sort of the future of public art? And we can have a you know, community dialogue around that as well. You know, thinking of Rome particularly, where, of course, it is a city almost completely constructed of public art in one, in more, in one way or another. Um, art, that, art that replicates older art, art mm -hmm. that, uh, that mirrors the, uh, the conventions and the excellence of, of the times. But also every now and again you're running around and you'll see digital art in Rome. You'll see uh, word art. Uh, you'll see all kinds of things that are integrated with, with uh, how do you say it, with light imagery, you know, particularly, that have a huge impact on buildings particularly, I, I right. would say. So, so it seems to me that this is really, when I first heard about it, I thought, oh, gosh, yeah, this is really you know, kind of interesting virtual idea. But no, actually not, because indeed art evolves, art technology evolves. I don't think quality evolves. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but certainly what, what you're working with does. And so, so really you are giving a lot of people a chance to do stuff, to sort of throw the football down the field, uh, you know, and wait for somebody to catch it. I think that's a very exciting thought. Sure. So some of these ideas that, that we're grappling with is, um, first of all, again, there's, there's no public. Yeah. So a lot of art, all art, is made for some level of an audience. And yes, there will be a scientific audience there, but as a civic public, there's not going to be an audience there. Um, but what if down the road the developer sort of um, concludes this space as a test site and decides to actually turn it into a city? And all of a sudden there's a population that comes 50 years down the road. And there's art there before there's public there. Mm. Um, and, and if the art is built around technology today that gets sort of locked in in that test city, and maybe it stays static or maybe it could evolve depending on what an artist might propose how would the artist uh, the i'm sorry the audience the incoming public respond to that or what if this test facility is maybe three weekends a year made available for public tours for people to come in and visit and they see that there's public art there um, how would they respond to it or is the public art something that can only be accessed virtually through cameras or data readings or whatever that anybody, that, that the public, the entire world public via the internet could have access to this art in a test city. I mean, there's so many yeah. layers of talking about a public in a place that is not designed for the public. Right. And how does, that, how does that work in the world of public art? Which has really been the best part of the whole ironic question that we're asking. So I'm thinking, if um, if global warming uh, is going to do what a lot of people think it's going to do, it's going to cause lots of migrations. Uh, uh, probably a global di uh, diaspora in some way or another, and probably what's going to happen after after we adapt to the reality of it, we're going to build virtual cities before those people arrive. <laughs> and I'm wondering if if this has any application for 
public arts as well. I mean, the, the, the whole notion of taking art as a tangible reality and placing it into a theoretical realm suddenly expands the possibilities astronomically. So indeed, would you, would you if you had to move huge populations, uh, could you predict what kind of art they would want to have? I don't know, but... That's a really interesting question. And actually, um, another class at UNM is um, about art in the public sphere, picked up on our call for artists, oh, okay. and they created a series of questions and sent them back to our class. And one of them was about, could somebody propose a process for modeling the best public art for an entire new city. Wow. And and there's, you know, there's entire cities that have been designed and some have come to fruition and some haven't. Yeah. And the artists are always sort of in there on the cutting edge of thinking about art for places we haven't gone. I mean, I, I'm aware of an entire movement of artists thinking about public art for outer space, right? Oh, <laughs> if, okay, if we sure. ever move into outer space. Sure. But this idea of, of um, yes, I can see where particularly cities in the southwest might be the kind of place where moving entire populations after dealing with global warming issues of you know shrinking shorelines or whatever might happen yeah, yeah. um this you know this could be a way that we could provide it sort of as an a example of how art can get thought out ahead of time as it's as it's instead of being responsive only responsive to whatever is there first, the art actually gets included at the very beginning, which is a very, very different place for public art in, in today's world to be. As you mentioned, Rome and you know a, a lot of European places, the, the whole city is practically art. It was thought about that way, but in contemporary city building, you know, public art is always thought of as an after effect, as sort of, it comes after. It's not really integrated in, in the beginning. So this might be a new way of modeling it into, from the very beginning again. Yes. So, so you mentioned earlier on, uh, uh, before we were on air, that, that you had a response from another university as well? Yes, one of my colleagues um, in the public art uh, management world teaches a public art class um, at Claremont University in the Los Angeles area, nice. and her class picked up on it, and they're very intrigued by it as well. So we don't know if maybe there might be some students from other you know, um, courses around the country that might throw their hat in for ideas and instructors using it as, you know, court of, maybe an assignment, you know, something to respond to. Um, but we are very excited, uh, especially the College of Fine Arts has been extremely supportive of this project. And um, they actually built us a blog site. Oh, um, it's on Tumblr, and it's called Public Art Roadmap Site, C-I-T-E. And we're, we're building that out now with information about the call for the for public art at Site City and um, hoping to get some dialogue where this whole project can live on well past this semester. Yeah. And we're going to post the actual call for artists up there so that other universities, um, you know, planning departments, arts administration, public art students can tap into this as a theoretical sort of, you know, exploration of public art ideas. So we're hoping that it has a little longer life than just this semester, not to mention if global uh, Pegasus Global Holdings actually decides to do something with it. That would be fascinating. Well, I see sort of sort of down the road as, as this class of yours joining up possibly with classes in community and regional planning and architecture to to create uh, not solar cities this time, but uh, but completely integrated fine art cities in <laughs> in which the arts are used to empower and enlighten and inform and comfort whole populations. Actually, the more I think about it, the more I think it's fascinating, exciting, really. Well, quite interestingly, one of the students in my public art management class is also taking a community and regional planning course right now. Oh, okay. And so she's really bringing in a lot of interesting dialogue about thinking about, you know, culture in a city and um, society and how it's, playing into this project where she's really grappling with the idea of a city of no with no population yeah. but she is really looking towards um, that that um, research community the the private citizen 
of the city as being the audience for this public art. Right. And, you know, that we really, it's been such an amazing dialogue to really kind of get down to, is a city a city without people? What is the role of public? You know, what is the role of public in public art? Yes. And does the public have to be present? Can the public just know about it and the art exists? You know, kind yeah. of the age old question, yeah. Right? Yeah, right? There's nobody around. <laughs> is it still art? Yeah. Right? Is it still public art? Yeah. <laughs> so we've just had these amazing discussions while always trying to keep it about managing a project as well. And I have to admit, had I known how off in the weeds we can get with our discussion about you know sort of theoretical ideas of public and place and sight and meaning and art um, as a project you know with proposing an idea for public art in the city with no public I might have picked a different site that's a little more real <laughs> to keep them on task with managing a project but right, this right. is turning out to be so fascinating that you know when you hear that you know other you, other classes are picking up on it and it's just such a rich dialogue with the students so you know I'm thinking about um, also the possibilities of, of of creating and retrofitting cities and having public art not be an add-on but becoming an integral part of the whole planning process because uh, one needs to start to think about just exactly what is the function of public art. Why have it? Is it, um, I mean, there's thousands of good reasons, and I'm sure we could spend an hour and a half. But, but basically, um, it's about mental health. It's about aesthetic health, which is a tremendously powerful and important thing. Which, and... If you're going to be retrofitting cities and redoing them, for heaven's sakes, let's don't make ugly cities. Right. That we can have depressing cities. Let's make something else. So this this something really has a has a much more I mean in my mind anyway a much more realistic twist than it did when I first heard about it and, and was fascinated by it. I wanted to talk to you on air about it. So how do you think that would play out? I mean, do you think it would be possible to retrofit a city and how would you get the arts into it early like that? So there's actually some really good examples of other cities oh, that have done that. So mm -hmm. in the 1980s, Phoenix um, put together a public art master plan that was really based entirely on their infrastructure. Phoenix was doing a huge amount of um, rebuilding their canals, their water canal systems, their 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 water moving systems, their interstates, and a lot of other um, public amenities like trails. And they had a public art master plan that really integrated public art into all of those like wholesale redesigns of a lot of infrastructure. The city of Calgary, um, Canada, has actually done a very similar type of thing with a lot of their water waterway systems and and transportation systems and integrating public art um, into their city that way as they're t really kind of rebuilding entire um, movement systems within their cities. So there's some really good examples of that. Um, we think that th some proposals might come through site that way of really looking at public art integrated into their whole one certain level of infrastructure, even though there's only one overpass and off ramp, you know, they'd be looking at it like that. But that's certainly um, real life application, but also a great exploratory application here with this, with this call for art for sight. So we start to think about, uh, I started to think about uh, uh, the WPA. Uh, and I got to thinking about the role that it played in creating Albuquerque. Uh, in a way that uh, that I think probably hadn't happened in the country before, when you know, uh, architecture and the arts were intimately integrated. So this, in a certain sense, thinking about it in this way, seems almost like an extension of the works prior to administration in a funny way. Because if you're going to be planning retrofitted cities, and you're going to be planning humane places, not just concentration camps for benighted and blighted people who who get caught up in this kind of thing. Uh, you have a model to look to already, you know, and uh, and I'm wondering if that's evolvable. I think it is probably, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So for Albuquerque, we have thought about that a little bit, but um, we don't typically 
we haven't really taken a big holistic look at our city of sort of redesigning things. We've we've done some very large scale projects like, you know, the Big Eye and the the overpasses at Coors and Paseo. Um, but I think the BRT, or I'm sorry, we've now changed it. It's now the ART, which I love, the Albuquerque Rapid Transit. We're looking at integrating art into into that kind of infrastructure. Um, so from a real life perspective in Albuquerque, public art. And the way it's funded is integrated into these new systems that we're implementing and, and, and developing, connecting the bike trail system, you know, better tied in with transportation. But um, I, I do think that there's other cities out there that are really looking at redesigning at a much, much deeper level their entire cities where public art has the capability of being integrated in in a, in a systematic sort of method instead of kind of piecemealing like yeah. like we like we've done in Albuquerque. And so I think it's going to be really fascinating to see what these proposals are like that come in from artists around the rest of the country um, that maybe have been involved in those types of discussions in other cities and whether or not those proposals actually end up being about integrating artwork into the whole sort of structure of this new test city or are they going to come in more or less in the traditional way of sort of like, you know, putting a few pieces down in a few locations? Um, and then, of course, you know, we have that whole virtual digital data element that could just blow us all away with thinking about public art and in a much more sort of ethereal sort of context or environment that maybe doesn't even exist physically, but it, it adds an entire layer of art over the whole city somehow because it's based on data i i, I don't know where the artists are going to go where, what the ideas are going to be but we're so excited to to see them and i think that again because we have the capability of um letting these proposals live on longer um that they could really be springboards for discussions on these other kind of issues that you're talking about we know that when we go to certain airports we feel better than we do in certain other airports. <laughs> uh, everybody knows that you walk into certain buildings and you feel better than you do when you walk into certain other ones. This is the, this is the unmeasurable, untestable, possibly, uh, aspect of the arts. But indeed, do you suppose it is testable? <laughs> I mean, could you, could there actually be, and I don't want to, I'm not talking about money here or materialism, but, right. but there are clear-cut actual psychological humanitarian benefits to being in a beautiful place as right. opposed to being into an ugly one. And so maybe there's an opportunity to, to test, test such a thing. I, how would you go about that, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> now, that's a good question. Um, how would we test public art? I mean, that's something that we've talked about a lot. Um, what is there to test? I mean, you could really easily just say, oh, well, we could test new materials because that's kind of what this is about. We could test yeah. new technologies. But we've also talked a lot about this kind of similar idea about testing public art concepts. And then who do you test them on? Do you bring in a test public for a short amount of time and see how they respond to it? Or do you test the way the artwork interacts with the architecture, which at this point we don't really know what the architecture is. It'll probably be something kind of traditional, I'm guessing, oh, yeah. because if they're designing the city to test legacy infrastructure as we all sort of know and live in it, that's what they're going to do. But what if we have the opportunity to truly test the impacts of public art um, in all kinds of different ways, especially this way of how it affects the public being in an, in the environment. I would love to see something like that and wish there was, you know, some big research grant that we could be one of the clients yeah. of the test city and say, okay, we'll come in and, you know, do all the public art part of this and do the testing for you while you're testing out your, you know, your um, solar and wind turbine energy sources and new technologies. Um, it would be amazing to actually do that. But I can only imagine what it would be like to set up the test parameters on, you know, yeah. having people fill out surveys. Does this public art make you feel better in this <laughs> test city with no people? I mean, how do we go about doing that? You know, 
We go. try to test public art in our, in our real city all the time, and it's really hard to get a read on it. But we know that when people call us and say, you know, I just visited your city and we love it because there's so much public art there, or I've been living in the city for 25 years and I just realized that this thing around the corner is a beautiful piece of public art. Thank you for putting it there. Mm. You know, those are the anecdotal little stories that we get back. How could we put those into a test situation? I don't know, but I'm sure somebody will figure it out. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the proposals comes back to just be about testing testing art. I've been lucky enough to be teaching classes in, in, the, in the, uh, the School of Architecture and Planning. And a couple of semesters ago, uh, an architecture student was studying what he described as neurological ar architecture, uh, or, the, or the neurological implications of architecture, looking at the same old age-old question. Why do some places make you feel terrible? Why are they designed to make you feel terrible or small or insignificant or lost? And why do some people, uh, some places make you feel wonderful and expand your powers and empower you? Right. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's, it's part of cognitive science, really. You know, and, and part, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure that this, that the, you know, the same kind of, same kind of details would apply to public art as well. The, um, so, do you, uh, um, I know it doesn't matter if this place gets constructed or not in terms of the uh, this the site place, if you will, uh, uh, between Crucis and Deming. Uh, but is there a, a, con a considerable difference of what would happen if it did get built? Would this uh, would this impact f uh, future mm. uh, uh, future courses and as opposed to being virtually virtual, then it might be actually. <laughs> Virtually practical. <laughs> I'm thinking if this test city gets built, given the overwhelmingly supportive response we've had from the developers and from the um, the designers of the site, that there will likely be some element of this that gets incorporated. And, um, you know, who knows, maybe I'll shift careers and become an art scientist <laughs> and run their, run their test public art program for them, I don't know, which would be a lot of fun. But um, I, I have a feeling that they recognize that um, artists can really add to um, the notion of creativity and innovation and testing of information, you know, and maybe how that information gets used. It's a matter of whether or not, you know, they're going to have the funding for these kinds of things to go into it. But I think absolutely, if this test city gets built, um, they're, they're probably going to have people, all kinds of people knocking on their door saying, hey, we've got ideas we want to test. Right. And they're going to have to carve out what their primary function is. But again, given their su support for a call for public art, I think there there probably be willingness to have art as part of their test subject matter somehow. Well, you know, just getting to think about this is really a wonderfully expansive you know, experience. We've only been here 45 minutes or so on. Suddenly my little head is throbbing with, you know, with thoughts because indeed, I mean, there really is an actual physical dramatic difference between being in certain parts of a city mm -hmm. that nobody cares about, that was designed by perhaps a cold-hearted engineer with, no, with nothing else, or, or it's been left to be abandoned, or whatever the awful circumstances, and between being in a city where, or parts of a city where people love it and care for it enough to give their best to it. Uh, so, so this has, I think, a uh, huge potential, and I'm very interested in what happens in the future, and I'd mm -hmm. love to, I'd love to hear, hear more about it. So, thank you for being here. It's great today. Well, this is a project I'm definitely going to be following for a very long time. <laughs> I mean, you know, who knows? Maybe after the city's done being a test site, we the real test begins of adding so much more public art. Who, who knows? But I'm going to be following this for a long time, so I'll be glad to keep you posted. And thank you so much for having me on to talk about this. And you're just the person to really help, you know, unpack these ideas and help us think about it. So thank thanks. you so much. Thank you. <laughs>